So as usual, I'm going to have a sort of preamble to this episode, thinking about what's been going on in the previous episodes. And there were two things I wanted to, to talk about here. One was this whole th- business about the Santi not trusting us because we lie. The more I think about that, the more kind of silly it seems that, I mean, this shows up from time to time in science fiction that you have an alien species that can't lie and maybe they can't lie to each other. But the concept of deception is pretty well sewn into the fabric of evolution. There are plenty of predators and prey that rely on deception to either catch food or survive. And so this, I don't think this would be a concept that was entirely unfamiliar to them. And if you look at the tactics they've been using, there's a lot of deception that is going on, if nothing else, by omission. I mean, they deceived people into thinking the stars were blinking. Their entire strategy is to deceive us about what's going on in our reactors. They're, they you know, clearly had some degree of misleading with these supporters that they have on Earth. I'm reminded a bit of one of my favorite TV series, Babylon 5, where there's an alien race called the Mimbari, and one of the things that Mimbari will tell you endlessly is that they do not lie. They never lie. Except that as we find out in the series, they lie all the time. They lie when they think honor is at stake. They lie when they think that would humiliate someone. They lie for you know, when it's necessary for security. And they lie a lot by omission, by not telling people about information they may have, which comes back to bite one of the characters in the butt. And so in the series, it becomes one of those things where you kind of see the little bit of the arrogance of this alien race saying, oh, we don't lie unless it's necessary. If you don't lie unless it's necessary, you lie. You may not be a pathological liar, but you're still are a bit of a liar. So I'm I'm very curious as to where we're going with this. The other thing was I like the way they are approaching the human response to this, that they're not just going to give up. They're trying to find solutions within the constraints that they have with these magical sofons or whatever. And um, I'm curious to see what they're going to do with this slingshot project. But, you know, there, it's sort of, there is sort of a chess game going on here where all the pieces are in play, but because the... Aliens don't really understand how we think what's going on in your head can be a little bit secret. Taking that thing that, you know, we don't lie at face value, we can use our capacity to lie in a way to overcome them. Uh, Scientifically, you know, one of the things I think they should be doing is trying to trap one of the sophons. You know, these are protons. They are charged particles. You can create a device that would potentially catch a charged particle. And I think in the book, they may have some way of weaseling out of this, that, oh, it can't be charged because of this reason or whatever. But put a whole bunch of traps of charged particles around a particle accelerator, and then you put the Sofon in a difficult position where either it has to leave the particle accelerator alone or it gets caught. And since there's only two of these, you catch one, you have their capabilities. So uh, that's still, at this point, my biggest scientific problem with the series, which otherwise is very good, which is these Sofons. As, as if you watched two episodes ago, you would have seen a very epic rant from me on the subject. So with that out of the way, let's get to episode seven of Three Body Problem. All right, you see the Big Dipper? Now keep going up to those two stars up there along that same line that sort of form the handle of the pan. Uh-huh. Keep going up. It's the first star that you see. All right, got it. That's it. That's DX3906. That's not DX3906. That's Polaris. It is. The stars our destination people pointed out to me in the telescope. No, no, that's that's not it. Will. As I said in the previous episode, one of the things I'm liking about here is that they're making a very concerted effort to show how much it sucks right. for good. someone to have terminal cancer. Uh, and I, a lot of series will sort of either gloss over that or make them look really nice up until the fine end. And so I like that they're uh, not pulling punches on that one. No, he's good. Yeah. yeah this is stupid. No one owns a star. Well, according to these documents, you are the legal owner of star number DX3906. Just for the record, there is no such star as DX3906, and that is not a designation that we would use. Almost all of the bright stars in the sky have names that come from either Greek or Arabic, such as 
uh, Betelgeuse or Cirrus or something like that. Most of the rest that are visible to the naked eye are named after the constellation they are in and in a Greek letter in descending order of brightness. So Alpha Leo, the brightest star in Leo, Leo. Beta Leo, the second brightest star in Leo. Alpha Leo would be Regulus, one of the brightest stars in the sky. And then after that, you get to things like HD numbers, which are from the Henry Draper catalog, and so on and so on. So this is not a designation for a star that we would actually use. They're not using an actual star as far as I can tell. And if this were a bright star, it would already have either a classical name or something like Gamma Leonis or something like that. He describes it as being in the Ursa Major constellation. So, you know, something like uh, Chi uh, Ursa Majoris, which would be Chi Ursa Majoris, formerly named Taiyang Shou, which is named the sun governor from Chinese astronomy. I just did that randomly, and that would be better than this uh, random name they picked out. Uh, I, I think um, they sort of did a little bit of a disservice there with this with this name. Cordless cells have been flushed with an anti-freeze cryoprotectant and cooled to minus 150 degrees. Slowed down a thousand fold, but not stopped. Okay, lots of interesting stuff in this scene. Um, I've talked about the idea of cryogenic hibernation uh, in my 2001 video. It is something that is long sought after but has never been achieved. One of the principal reasons it cannot be achieved is because when you bring a human body to such low temperatures, the ice has a tendency to crystallize and shatter uh, vital organs and veins and so forth. It basically, when you thawed someone out from that, they would be a mush, not a recovered person. So one of the things he says in here is that they, in addition to cooling them to minus 150 degrees, they have a preservative in there that keeps those ice crystals from forming, that keeps a sort of antifreeze to keep those ice crystals from forming and keep them alive. And if you slowed someone's metabolic rate down a thousand fold, then 200 years in space would become, you know, a couple months. So uh, interesting concept, but I also like the detail they're putting into it. And testing it on a monkey or ape or whatever this is, uh, that is <laughs> tried and true tradition all the way back to the space program to test these on animals before you test them on humans. No, really, Cora. Cora, really. Oh, interesting. They're using a, a, um, a monkey that they've trained in sign language to test its uh, me mental functions to make sure that they haven't cooked its brain while it was freezing. That's actually really good attention to detail. I doubt he would thaw that fast, but... It's TV. Which reminds me of the monkey preschool lunchbox game my kids used to play. There's only one person on Earth who can oversee the plan. On Earth? That's a bit much. Aristotle thought false humility was just as bad as arrogance. Aristotle thought that rocks fell down instead of up because they loved the ground. <laughs> it's true. Why only you? Why not someone else? No one else can handle it. If we want to accelerate the probe to the required speed with the propellant available to us... The heaviest payload it can carry is under two kilograms. That's a very small person. I would say person is the ever-changing pattern dancing through the neurons of their brain. If that exists, the person exists. We would, however, have to remove that brain from their skull. It'll be enough for them to rebuild the rest. If they do, we have a man on the inside. I kind of like this idea. You know, we can't, you, if you're sending a little probe, and especially with such a small cargo, you can't send a bomb. You know, you're going to know their physiology, so you couldn't send a virus or anything like that. But send a human. Have them actually meet a human. Maybe they'll decide this species isn't worth exterminating. Maybe they'll decide we can peacefully coexist. I and mean, it's one of a number of strategies I'd be outlining, but I, I do like uh, where this is going. I do think that the series 
shot itself in the foot a little bit though by having that scientifically inaccurate quantum entangling thing. I think this plot point would work a bit better if that quantum entangling thing didn't, didn't work. If the Sophons were an AI and functioning independently, they, they've been given an order and they have 400 years to carry it out. When you actually meet the Salty, they might be different. They might have changed their minds. And especially if you send them a human brain and they can reconstruct some kind of mechanism to communicate with it, that might change their minds by the time they get here. And so I think you would be able to emphasize this point a little better if the Sophons were acting kind of independently and unable to communicate with the Salty. So you're saying, let's bypass them because we know we can't reason with the Sophons and go directly to these aliens and try to show our humanity to them. So I like, I like this plan among the other plans they are coming up with. Sometimes when you're really high, you see people. Or maybe it's when you're dying. But I see you. And I love you. Ooh. And it's all right. to do it and I won't. <laughs> it's all right. That was a really nice theory scene. Um, one of the things that it reminds me of is... Um, Having uh, worked, uh, my parents were both in medicine, having worked in that field for a while. Um, sometimes when someone dies, it's harder on the living than on the person dying. You know, they get to the point where the world is at now where they sort of accepted it. And, you know, it's sometimes harder to be left than to leave. So uh, I, that was a really uh, a beautiful scene, I think. Humor is a very personal thing. Some people understand it and some people don't. Some jokes are so private, they only make sense to two people. But jokes are important. We wouldn't survive without them. Don't you agree? He's clearly trying to tell him something, but I'm not getting what she's telling him. I hope my joke doesn't cause you any trouble. Because if they find you, they'll rebuild you. And maybe maybe they just, they turn you into a program and they communicate with you through an interface. You can't see, you can't, you can't hear, you can't feel. Like an isolation tech question goes in, answer comes out. Whether you like it or not, they just read your mind. So they read Diary of Nobody. And then they switch me off and we're back to dead. I think that the objections Saul is raising here are completely valid. I don't know that I would be able to do this. I don't think I would. You know, maybe it won't be as bad as all that. Maybe it would be like, um, like I'm a pet to them. Maybe I'll be like entertainment. What do you do for entertainment? What's your favorite movie? Uh, shining. <laughs> I never had many friends. Thanks to you guys. Always felt like enough. Well, that was a really... Yeah, that'll hit you. <laughs> I'm gonna miss you. I mean, that scene could have been really cheesy, but I thought they, they, they did it really well. I can walk from here. If you 
don't mind, but could I have a few minutes alone? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Oh, that's a mistake, time. buddy. Never leave someone alone when Tatiana's roaming around. When I was your age, this was some of the most beautiful country in the world. It'll all be better when the Lord gets here. No, I won't. I'm sure it will. And you and Jay knows it won't. Did the Lord tell you why they sent you to me? You deserve a rest. So, uh, probably in the middle of the pack, towards the bottom, I thought there were a few scenes in there that didn't 100% work for me, um, but it's still, it was still uh, quite good. I don't think it was a bad episode, just on the continuum of the series so far, probably towards the lower end, um, just because it seemed to be kind of wrapping things up and sort of setting things up for next season, so another one of those intermediate episodes. In terms of science... Um, where they get to with Will, I think, uh, uh, was very well done. That you have, you want this project, and because you have a limited number of bombs, you know, force equals mass times acceleration. So if your force that you can generate is going down, your mass has to go down too if you want to get to the acceleration you're going to need to get to 1% of the speed of light. And so they're going to have to reduce their mass dramatically. And especially with Cry, you know, a cryogenic system, the bigger the body, the system needed to maintain that is going to expand even faster. And so reducing it down to a few pounds and a human brain, and they got there, I think, in a reasonable way. And uh, I, as I said during the, during the episode, I did like the way they showed that cryogenic system, how they're testing it, how they've addressed the problems and so forth. So clearly some thought and knowledge went into that. I do find myself agreeing with Wade that this sale of the stars has no actual legal value and so forth that it's a gimmick to raise money for the war cause so i'm wondering where they're going with that plot thread because this is a very lean series and doesn't usually have a lot of extraneous stuff so they must be going somewhere with that but overall i'm it you know i think it wrapped up will's art pretty nicely and uh seems to be wrapping up you and jay's art arc so I guess we'll have to see what happens in episode eight to continue this. Um, I'm, I've been alerted that I am not telling people to subscribe and hit the like button. So subscribe and hit the like button. In fact, subscribing is the only way to prevent alien invasion like this. We, we can say that, right? That's legal? No? Okay. Well, subscribe anyway. Uh, but until we meet again for the season finale, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching.